Welcome to the Africa Dialogue Series 2021, which, as you are aware, is a platform whose aim is to make Africa's voice heard loud and clear through political discussions on the sustainable development of our region. The, the theme of the African Dialogue Series for this year is Cultural Identity and Ownership Reshaping Mindsets. It draws on the theme of the African Union for 2021, which is arts, culture and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want. This theme is, of course, anchored in Aspiration 5 of the African Union Agenda 2063, which looks to achieve an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values and ethics. The Africa Dialogue Series is organised by the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa of the United Nations, OSAA. They work closely with the Youth Division of the African Union Commission and the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, UNESCO. This dialogue among young people aims to make the voice of young people heard. Young people account for the majority of the African population. These dialogues today will focus on the sub-theme, human capital, culture and heritage, unleashing potential. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Musa Wille. I am an archaeologist and I specialise in cultural heritage. And I today have the pleasure of welcoming Ms. Avenir Mekang. Avenir Mekang. Avenir Mekang is an anthropologist and a doctoral candidate at the University of Paris in the Geography Department. Avenir has a wealth of experience in the areas of culture and heritage in general and often, or sometimes, supports UNESCO, the African World Heritage Fund, and other organisations in compiling nomination files for the inscription of World Heritage Sites in the, re in the African region on the World Heritage List. After her, we'll have Eva Kwamu from Cameroon. Ms Kwamu is a project officer acting as the Africa Coordinator for Futures Literacy at UNESCO. She is currently a doctoral candidate on issues of complexity and law at the University of Lancaster in the United Kingdom and studies at the Complex Systems Centre of the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. So, without further ado, we'll kick off with our two dear um, colleagues, Ms Kwamu, first of all. The first question, if I may, the first question pertains to the future of Africa, which is its young people. How can we rely on the African youth and how can we expect them to tap into the culture and heritage of this region? And in asking this question, I'm asking you to share with me and with our audience here today a number of examples of youth policy within the areas of arts and culture in your countries. So, if I may, I perhaps begin with Eva, first of all. Eva, you have the floor, just maybe for one minute to share with us your ideas on this notion of potential. I've got, well, just a minute to share my ideas on that question. Well, very well. And so I'll start with a first point which is linked directly to my work on futures literacy and that is the skill which involves understanding each other, why and how we anticipate things. Across the continent, where this issue is concerned, what's crucial will be the ability to recognise that for a long time we've had captive futures, futures held captive, futures that have been stolen. This is, of course, linked to colonisation, but it's something that continues today. We see it, whether it be in the ruse of Dakar, and we've seen this more recently in Cameroon, we've also seen it in East Africa, that is a region I know better still, uh, 
for example, we've seen this in Kenya and Tanzania. This recognition carries a lot of weight. It, it, it has symbolic significance. Acknowledging that we've lost some of our power to act is, a, is, is symbolically significant, and that recognition is also freeing, because if we understand and accept that something has been stolen, that means we're also recognising that th there are things that have been preserved and things we can gain or reclaim. And this brings us to the notion of skills. There's the issue of training being made available to young people so that they can contemplate the future that they want or the future that we wish to see more broadly if we, we want to use the terminology of the African Union. But another broader question arise, uh, arises and that is making tools available to young people so they can shape their futures but at the same time making skills available to them so that they can seize upon these skills and shape for themselves a future that they think is in line with their values and allows, uh, allows them to exist as their authentic selves. Where this is concerned, we've seen that there have been a number of public and private policies, that's not really the crux, oh, the, the, what's important, whether they're public or, or private, but the fact is they've moved towards skills development in order to allow young people to anticipate the future, to carve out a future, the, the, teaching them skills to the, the skills that involve calling things into question, negotiating that will also help them to shape their futures as will making better use of their imagination. These same questions arise in matters of law, which is my uh, area of, of expertise, and it arises in matters of finance or economic areas or issues linked to the creative media. Today, for example, we talk about the notion of Afrofuturism, and the, the and he, this is something that's often exploited in in cultural arenas. There are official images which are propagated, but we and we ask young people to simply replicate these images, but we don't allow them to shape their own futures and use their own images. Then there's the idea of having institutions that are ready to allow young people to negotiate what they mean, what they understand culture to be. And these institutions aren't really in place. And it's also, but that they, they, young people need to have this fora, for, these fora rather, to negotiate governance as well and what that means to them. And that's a dialogue. Thank you, Eva. Thank you for sharing with us these ideas. They're very interesting indeed. Perhaps now we're going to go to Avenir. Avenir, do you have anything to add? Thank you, Musa, for the question. I think that Kwamu spoke at great length about training and teaching, and I'll do the same. If today... Well, today we need to look at whether young people can really support their nations, whether this be through enhancing, promoting or raising awareness of uh, heritage. We need to make sure they can support their nations in doing that. And to do that, they need to have access to training institutions or centres. Because as things stand in Africa, we have very few centres or universities dedicated to the training of genuine specialists in African heritage. There is also the fact that today African heritage is more rooted than ever before in oral practices than in written ones. So I think we really need to give young people tailored, appropriate tools which allow them to hone their imagination and harness their creativity. These tools must also be digital because today with the COVID pandemic it's becoming increasingly difficult for African countries to promote and enhance the potential of the rich cultural heritage that they have. So, for example, museums need to perhaps have a, an internet site which is able to host virtual exhibitions. We often see such a facility in many European museums, such as the Louvre, the Quai Branly Museum. So... 
where Africa is concerned, we need to give young people proper training and integrate them into the labor market. If we look at the World Heritage List in UNESCO, we see that Africa is underrepresented and we often ask how that's going to change. There are no qualified experts in this area, so Africa really needs to focus on training human capital. After training, emphasis needs to be given to awareness raising, promotion and enhancing policies, policies which allow us to promote cultural, cultural heritage. So we need to, with all of this, we need to get young people on board, whether this be with national, international or local programs. That will make it possible to really support states that are party to various training and educational programs and other capacity building programs. Young people need to be brought on board. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Avenir. I think you've both broached a crucial issue, which is the training of this human capital. It is, it is a crucial issue today if we wish to be able to harness the potential of young people if we want to do that, our politicians need to invest in training these young people. That is vital. But where that's concerned, I'd perhaps like to put another question to you. And that is, do we really often talk about financial training? Maybe we do. But where training is concerned in culture or cultural heritage is concerned, and specifically where young people in these fields are concerned, young people in Africa, is the training they receive in this area adapted to the realities on the ground? Ms. Kwamu, do you have anything to say on that? I hear that in your question there's almost several questions rolled into one. There's, there's a simple question, first of all. There's a culture market, and then... Uh, training courses that are offered by training institutions. So we need to look at whether the courses in our schools and universities that are being offered are really in line with the demands of the existing culture market. And then there's a second question perhaps in what you asked, and that touches on what Avenir was just saying. And that is the matter of looking at how we consider culture. We often have schools of thought when it comes to what constitutes a good cultural policy. This might focus on museums, exhibitions. There might be organizations of musicians. These are just two elements of the cultural field, if you like. But, but there's this idea that we perhaps look at culture too rigidly. So we come up against a series of problems and there are maybe people better placed than me to discuss pedagogical difficulties when it comes to the world of culture and the difficulties in training people for that world. Then there's a second point, and this is the reproduction of cultural systems. We have before us a wealth of cultures cultures which mix together oral and written traditions, hybrid cultures. We have very mobile societies. They're not always... Uh, uh, boxed into one culture, one cultural form. Things change over weeks, months. and but, but what happens is often our cultural formats and our way of seeing culture is quite rigid. And perhaps there are other societies where their models of seeing culture are perhaps better. Would it be possible for young people to promote propose other ways of seeing and understanding culture. For example, I'm thinking of Togo, where there were innovative art exhibitions and there was a series of uh, arti um, art artists that exhibited their work that had been living under co co colonialization. BPI in Paris uh, welcomed works by South African and Zimbabwean artists, and we see that there are other formats of culture that we don't see. We don't see them in the official arenas of culture across the world. And here, I think young people already are proving that they have a lot to offer, but the question is how we can make these new cultural formats that young people are offering more visible and ensure that 
new cultural formats are properly uh, reflected in the spheres of power. Thank you. Avenir, do you have anything to add? Yes, as I said, I would say that education plays a fundamental role in the development of national and local identities. However, since gaining independence, many African countries have seen that reforming curricula remains a true, a real problem because the majority of, in the majority of African countries, the content of curricula does not really reflect cultural realities on the ground, nor do they reflect socio and economic realities at either a local or national level. Often, curricula is simply a, ca a calc of European curricula, if I can put it like that. As I said in answer to your first question, we don't really have universities or institutions devoted entirely to training true specialists. For example, if I take the example, the placing of African cultural heritage on heritage lists, we often call in international experts, or Western experts, so that path that states can prepare their nomination files to have their heritage listed on these heritage lists. And that is because we don't really, we haven't really ensured that our education is in line with local needs when it comes to cultural heritage and valuing that. So I think it would really be beneficial to make our teaching more relevant. And at the same time, we need to strengthen the cultural identity that we have of ourselves as Africans. African curricula really do need to be adapted to local and national uh, identities. They need to be focused on national and local cultures cult and cultural values. These are all vital goals. And they need to be fo focused on African models, behaviors, and morals. Africa has a great deal of potential to tap into. It's, it's been underexploited thus far. Today, we, Af Africa thus far has, has kind of been informed about its own culture and has been left bereft of ways to express itself. But Africa needs to be able to take ownership of its cultural heritage to be made aware of it. African youth need to know where they come from, know their roots, their origins, and that involves education. So we need to, in light of the above, review our national curricula to ensure they really do reflect our African identity and what we understand to be African culture because if we don't appreciate our own culture, we can't promote it. And it's for that reason that Africa needs to invest in its young people. And to, while we don't invest in young people, we can't move forward. We have so much to say, so much to do, so many contributions to make, so much change to bring to the table. But in order to be able to contribute to all these changes, we need to be made involved and our motivation needs to be harnessed and young people need to be made a priority with everything concerning Africa today and, and that would be what I would say to you by way of an answer. Perfect. We can sense from what you've said that you, you are really committed as a young person. We hear in you the commitment of that African, the African youth that we wish to see. to allow communities to hear each other and to allow sustainable development. It's through training of young people and properly channeling their energy that we'll be able to fashion Africa's future. I think we've got the Dean of our university in Dakar here. He was saying that young people need to equip themselves with scientific knowledge. That's crucial for Africa's economic development. For Africa to develop economically, training is crucial. We were saying 
that where cultural heritage is concerned, training provided in this field needs to be in line with the realities to ensure that we can see this cultural ownership and the we can so that we can see ourselves take ownership of our own heritage. There needs to be proper training on the ground. In the University of Dhaka, there is a, lab a doctoral laboratory that conducts anthropological and cultural research. And this laboratory really has turned things on their head. It's, it's not simply where young people come to hear lectures or do complete courses, but this laboratory invites people from outside so that they're able to share realities on the ground with the young pe students where cultural heritage is concerned, and that's vital. And you refer to this, I think, Ms. Kwamu, in connection with Togo. All of this is part of tapping into our potential, and this all involves proper training. I might ask you whether you know that if in your regions there are examples that you can perhaps share with us of regions that have succeeded in investing in this sector, this cultural sector. Do you know examples of this capacity for innovation, examples of good practice where cultural heritage training is concerned? Yes, I can say myself, in 2019, after my master's in Italy, I established an association with someone from Benin and someone from France. This association looks to promote cultural heritage in the African region. To date, we have two projects underway. We have one in the Mu National Museum of Cameroon, which looks to digitize the collection of the National Museum to hold a virtual exhibition, because with COVID, we realized that things slowed down. And that halted and impeded efforts to enhance and promote African cultural heritage. We also have another digitization project and that is the digitization of information pertaining to the Cameroon cultural sites that are on heritage lists. There's also a flagship program in Cameroon which support, supported African governments in giving new value to their cultural heritage and really appreciating it. There are a great many young people today that work with that that program and there's Bajul Station which is a platform for Cameroon artists and all of these projects fight tooth and nail to lend value to cultural heritage so I would say that where Cameroon is concerned Young, governments have really had to sit up and take note of what young people are doing to preserve Cameroon cultural heritage. I hope I answered your question. Perfect, Avenir. I could see that in asking you that question, I knew when I asked you the question that you were going to give me a wealth of examples that you were very proud of. Ms. Kwamu? Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. In terms of examples, what is interesting is that there are specific examples which make it possible to respond to the immediate needs of the world of culture. There are also examples which make it possible for us to deal with a long-term vision. 
We've already discussed the difficulties between the mismatch, because of the mismatch between our training and what the world of culture offers us or could offer us. What we've seen are that there are initiatives, the School of African Heritage, there's a series of processes already in place which makes it possible to deal with these issues. The other issue is whether young people as a whole should be interested in these questions. Culture is not uh, compartmentalized in people who want to work for the world of music or publishing. Uh, books go beyond that. Once again, it's an issue of looking at our society and how to take decisions which reflect us, which are real when it comes to what represents us and the values we wish to convey. And so if we talk about appropriation, that's what it's all about. To have a culture which is uh, disseminated, we have a series of initiatives. I'm thinking of Vendagraph in Senegal, for example, which has been going on since the 80s. There are initiatives like Kabako in uh, Mali, which uh, have extended to the level of Madagascar. There are a series of initiatives which are thinking about knowledge in a more participatory fashion. Telling ourselves that there is a problem which is local, uh, whether it's an issue of air pollution or presenting our artworks, or saying that there is a response which exists outside, as if culture were something external to us, not something which is deeply anchored within us. And this is a possibility we have by using mechanisms, mechanisms which call on collective intelligence. We should have more interdisciplinarity, more discussions between the various disciplines and uh, stakeholders. And it is through this kind of initiative that we can ensure that culture is as complete as possible. Because it is what it is, and culture is incarnated because it knows what it is. If we have a discussion uh, just on the level of the three of us, or on a broader level, uh, by bringing in our entire audience, what we realize is that we, we each come with our own little uh, part of the picture. I come with the knowledge of the process which makes it possible uh, for us to use collective in intelligence in the process, making me think about the, the future on a plurality of issues, the future of innovation, of culture, of music. And when it comes to issues of heritage, what we realize is there is something complementary that we're looking for just looking at the other who could be somewhere else in the West, we realize that we've already begun to appreciate what we are. And the whole issue is uh, the future and culture, as we convey it, is precisely going to be how we can appreciate what we are. Thank you, Cuomo. Yes, I think you've hit on something very important there, complementarity interdisciplinarity. It's essential to boost this sector because we often have the tendency to think that to work in these areas you just have to be a specialist. Earlier you cited the example of the three of us discussing today. More oriented on issues of world heritage I'm an archaeologist, for example. We could have another person who is uh, more savvy about marketing. Uh, it could be a sort of uh, point team, if I could call it that. It's something that we could try to imagine to establish a strategy to give more value to our cultural products. And I think that this is what we need today, what we need still in our training schools, in our universities. How can we uh, have uh, startups, uh, quote unquote, interdisciplinary young people to work in these areas today? Citing Senegal once again, we have seven sites uh, on the list of uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And th there are 
very few initiatives of young people to make the most of these sites. These are sectors that can uh, encourage the creation of up to thousands of jobs. This is something which is really there uh, that, uh, that we should make the most of, uh, that uh, the sector of cultural and creative industry should make the most of. What is urban culture, for example? Uh, it's something uh, which can generate millions of dollars. Uh, on that front, uh, I'd like to ask you, Eva, with this urban culture today on political issues, we have a tendency to think that the stakeholders in industries of urban culture are not really good citizens. They're people who are there as critics of power, etc. So behind uh, this work of, uh, critici of criticism, something extraordinary is really happening. Uh, perhaps you, you can, you gave me some examples earlier. You talked about graph extra in Senegal or in other sectors. Perhaps uh, other examples of successes. What is interesting is, and I'm going to cite examples which are perhaps obvious, but which also count. When I was talking about uh, working from early childhood on uh, the future of value in the framework of uh, the meetings held about the ECHO, the new currency which is going to replace the Central African franc, we worked with a series of young people in Lomé to hear what they had to say about these issues. And uh, we, what we realized is that there is a series of initiatives which uh, uh, is being conducted by City Hall, for example, to uh, work with young people. But the idea is how to ensure the continuity of a, co a community of practice when I was talking about uh, Kabako in Bamako, this was a very good example for me because when you realize that you're talking about a continuous activity, it doesn't necessarily mean seven years, obviously. It's great if we can do it because it's a format of a school, but, perhaps, but sometimes even trainings of six months make it possible for young people to bring together their know-how with uh, high-tech uh, skills and uh, with uh, more quote-unquote low-tech uh, skills. Uh, for example, how to manage relationships, how to uh, care for plants, and all this mixed with meetings with local artists makes it possible to stimulate this complementarity we were talking about earlier. This is a discipline uh, you were talking about earlier. And there are also ad hoc uh, initiatives that were launched by young people. And what I can suggest is also that we uh, put links to different platforms so they can have more visibility. I don't know if this is possible, but I would be very happy to do that. Once again, if we think of complementarity, what is missing sometimes is a simple possibility of being made visible, of being seen. When we say that young people um, well, sometimes they've organized things, but other people aren't aware of it. Uh, other people in other uh, countries or, or even in our own cities haven't heard about it. This is one of the major challenges, uh, the relationship between initiatives which calls for visibility. Uh, for example, when we are talking about a very clear idea of what uh, underground uh, rappers who make their music, who are in opposition to leaders, for example, uh, we might think that these artists uh, don't uh, really meet uh, the, the codes, uh, but it goes far beyond that. We're putting together what's happening in the cities and in our villages. For me, this kind of initiative has a perfect place in what we call culture. 
Thank you, Eva. Let me go back uh, to uh, this issue of uh, visibility, and uh, that's why I'm going to give the floor to Avenir. Is uh, visibility really uh, what uh, these initiatives of young people on the World Heritage Site is all about? For young people to be able to engage with you or follow Avenir's model, uh, do they have the visibility that they need to do that? Is uh, is it the commitment to make the most of or conserve a, a world heritage for the future? Thank you for that question. I wouldn't really say visibility. I would call it uh, cultural entrepreneurship. With the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of Diversity in Cultural Expressions, we saw that there was more of a stress put on the key role of culture, creativity, and innovation to respond to this challenge of sustainable development and encourage economic growth as well as social promotion and inclusion. Today, whether we're talking about the area of culture or other fields, what has to be done is really encourage young people to get involved in what uh, I'm going to call cultural entrepreneurship, which today is not only a source of uh, heightening skills or personal training, but is also a source of work for young people. In the world today, whether it be a question of young people or Africa or women, I think that Africa would really uh, profit by better encouraging these young people or these stakeholders who are already have launched themselves in the area of culture. It would boost uh, the cultural imagination of those uh, people I'm going to call cultural stakeholders so that they can continue to uh, use their creativity to serve an Africa of the future. Uh, we seem to have lost Avenir, but you have indeed touched on a really important point linked to cultural entrepreneurship. Go ahead, Eva. I could hear Avenir. Uh, um, perhaps you couldn't. Avenir, could you try again, please? Thank you. I was saying that more stress should be put on cultural entrepreneurship because the objective of today of an Africa, which we can call an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa, should be based on a focus which puts young people at the very heart of development processes of uh, capacity building and access, and access to different opportunities. You're asking if there are indeed young people who are involved in the process. In uh, the registration of cultural assets, yes. But when we talk about experts and the cultural aspects, there are always very few of them. And we're trying this uh, with uh, heritage funds, which try to involve young people in the process. This is why there are several forms of training. Training in identifying uh, assets with high potential and training on uh, issues which makes it possible to move uh, programs forward. Young people must appropriate the process of registering cultural goods. But uh, then things get more complicated. It's more complicated because there isn't really um, background for this in Africa in general. And when it comes to the process of uh, registration of uh, cultural assets, I have to stress that 
we have to assess the value of cultural heritage. It has to be promoted, it has to be developed, and it has to be there, very much there, both in the present and in the future. Thank you, Avenir. The issue is a really interesting one. And uh, I don't really think that we can get to uh, the bottom of uh, this issue in just 30 minutes. Perhaps we'll uh, have another go around, a last one, uh, to hear what else you can share with us. Let me ask you about your favorite uh, forms of African art and your favorite African literary works, uh, the one you like the most. Eva? Well, I don't know if there's a literary work that I love more than any other, <clears throat> but the one which uh, made the deepest impression on me is a Senegalese work which Musa will uh, know about. Uh, it's called The Ambiguous Adventure. And uh, this had a very uh, strong impact on me. And there was a very interesting consideration in it. Uh, being able to win without being right. Uh, and uh, uh, a series of thoughts about the kind of truth uh, that uh, we're looking for. When we talk about cultural entrepreneurship, it's a response uh, which uh, sometimes can be understood as a capitalist response. And this has a series of problems raised by the uh, nefarious nature of some uh, capitalist uh, policies. So there's a kind of uh, double stakes game going on. What Avenir uh, was proposing was not to cultural entrepreneurship in the sense of having a startup that exhausts our cultural resources. It was uh, the fact of thinking of uh, cultural players as experts, the experts we're looking for. I'm not really sure what uh, position we're taking in this kind of situation. So sometimes I have the impression that there is a real world and a world to come. And this position, which uh, many young people have, and I include myself among them, because I think uh, that I also have this tendency of thinking, this uh, idea of, of saying, OK, I want to do something, but the world I'm developing in doesn't match with me. But the simple fact that I'm asking myself this question and that I take this position means that I have a values. I'm carrying these values. And I think that the whole challenge of jobs of culture is the fact of saying that you are in an ecosystem, you have values, and in that case, how can you reveal the existence of these values? How can you live in accordance with your principles? And the reason why I mentioned the ambiguous adventure is precisely because of that quest. That quest which can't be resolved in an hour of talking or by looking at a YouTube video. Um, I don't know what format we will respond to all of our problems, but uh, we must also think that there's a cultural focus founded on the search, founded on a path we all must build. And uh, the fact that we're starting to apply a method of uh, using uh, a user manual, so to speak, how to live our lives, how to continue with the cult culture and position ourselves as an actor of our culture will make it possible for us to move forward. Avenir, let me hear what you have to say about it. Yes, the work uh, I like the most was Guillaume Bonocchia, a Camer Cameroonian writer, and it's called The Three Suitors. Uh, this reflects a bit of what we have, uh, what uh, young people, especially young women, because in the, the African perception, young people 
older people, uh, parents uh, stop working because they think that uh, once they have a daughter, a grown daughter, this is a guarantee of wealth. Mm, to give your daughter a, a dowry, uh, you have to work. Uh, once you do it, you're going to have to pay a, a small fortune in order to uh, provide that dowry. So it's a way of boosting. But uh, when it comes to our discussion today, uh, uh, I would just say that uh, African uh, territories carry uh, an exceptional cultural heritage. Uh, there are landscapes, archaeological sites, architecture, which are really present. Uh, we come from different African countries. We have different uh, cultural practices. And we have objects that reflect uh, the history of uh, previous civilizations and the intelligence of people in using human resources and natural resources. So I think that Africa would really profit from establishing uh, cultural development and entrepreneurship uh, programs, as Eva was saying, which uh, give, which which stress uh, the promotion and protection of cultural and natural wealth. Through uh, this promotion, this uh, entrepreneurship, uh, which uh, is not just to earn money, but uh, to make the most of the wealth uh, and the cultural potential which Africa is full of and which is really growing. Then there is uh, the evaluation of the creative talent of young people because I think that today is when young people are really involved in cultural actions at the local, regional, national, and even international level. I think this will really boost their imagination and creativity and that Africa of today is going to uh, uh, profit from this. And when it comes to human capital uh, or social economic capital, I think that Africa is going to really uh, become an Africa of prosperity and uh, an integrated Africa, which will really recognize the values, knowledge, and know-how of its people. Then uh, there are cultural policies, the various activities, which uh, cover not only young people because uh, we're not just going to focus on uh, the challenges, but also on local communities. If we um, leave local communities out of our undertakings, I think that they will fail because local communities are really the ones driving the change and the difference. And without uh, young people's effective communication and participation, we won't really be going anywhere. Thank you very much, Eva. I think that we have used up our time. But quickly to summarize, I would say that to make the most of this cultural potential and uh, the heritage, heritage of the African region, we must invest in training of young people and also women, especially women. Because you've given us an example today of uh, what uh, we need to support uh, women and to train young people to make the most of their potential. My dear continent, thank you very much, Avenir. Thank you, Eva. And we'll continue this discussion on other platforms to mobilize African youth once again. Thank you very much.